Hello and welcome to Explaining Rust Analyzer, a series of lectures where we uh, try to understand how Rust Analyzer works internally, one subsystem at a time. So uh, we are in the middle of a series of lectures about Rust uh, Analyzer immutable lossless syntax trees. Uh, last couple of times we uh, worked with a mini Roman library where we tried to implement this uh, data structure from scratch. Today we'll finally start looking into an actual implementation inside the Rowan library. So let's get started. Let's open our editor and uh, yeah, uh, let's look at uh, what's inside. Yeah, uh, I must say that that is one of the most uh, tangled and complicated uh, bits of code in Rust Analyzer with a lot of uh, like unsafety and complexity and not really well documented and uh, well uh, laid out APIs, but whatever. Okay, uh, so uh, first of all, uh, just to cover some basics, when you work with syntax trees, uh, one of the uh, core vocabulary type for you is an offset uh, in a file, like position of a cursor or the selection range. And while Rust Analyzer library uses just uh, use sizes for those, uh, in Rust Analyzer we want to have a strongly typed uh, wrapper for that. And uh, that's where like this uh, two types, text range and uh, text size um, come from. They are very simple. Uh, it's just a wrapper around a 32-bit integer, which represents a text offset. And uh, similarly, uh, text range is a pair of uh, start range and end range, which uh, denotes like the standard um, a half uh, open range. Although kind of like the half openness here is. A bit interesting because strings are complicated, and like Rust strings are not like a string of characters. So there is uh, no such thing as like a position which points to a single point in the string. You can only like point between two cut points or point at a range of cut points. So uh, when we do uh, things like, for example, uh, check in if a range contains a specific cursor position, we actually oftentimes need to have both versions. Uh, one uh, which is about like strict contains and another uh, which uh, is about contains inclusive. Although, actually now that I think of it, I wonder if contains which is like not inclusive, doesn't actually make sense, but that's an interesting. So let's say we have some string like this one. And let's say that we have a range denoting like this whole string. So what does it mean for contains to be non-inclusive. I guess at least like this cursor position wouldn't be included, but this would be included. Yeah, I guess it's it it it, it kind of like ma makes sense probably. And anyway, I'm kind of like uh, I myself am always confused about which specific semantics do we want for text ranges and kind of like. Uh, uh, when I wrote this uh, separate text size library, I hoped that, hey, I would like be able to come up with like a sane mathematical model for describing text ranges, but still there's like this uh, edge cases which are required for this to work. Anyway, so uh, let's go back to where we were in the uh, lib.rs. Yeah, anyway, so uh, that's like uh, that I we use uh, to denote text ranges and uh, there are two benefits here. First is that we just have a strongly typed uh, wrapper. It's not just some U size, it's like text size. So, you know, we talk about text. And the second thing is that we store these things a bunch and we do want to save some space on them. So we use just 32 bit integers. That does mean that Rust Analyzer is restricted 
to working with only up to, uh, with files on the up to four gigabytes alone, but I think that's a reasonable restriction for a software. And in general, uh, like when I wrote Trust Analyzer, I kind of like realized that oftentimes you just care about like whatever amount of macros, whatever amount of tokens, uh, and all those kinds of things. But in practice, there are implementation limits. And it, in some sense, like to build uh, a software which is like fully robust, you need to make these implementation limits like very explicit. You like need to say things like, hey, like my software can work on files only up to like some specific amount or stuff like that. Anyway, uh, let's dive into an actual uh, implementation. We start with green nodes. As a reminder, uh, green nodes. Mm, oh, actually, uh, let's start with. Mm, I think like the font here is too big. It doesn't even fit uh, 100 lines in the screen. So let me make it smaller. Not sure what happened. Okay, yeah, that's that's much more reasonable. Yeah, I, I'm kind of like just switched the resolution of my screen to be smaller, and somehow the fonts get like so much larger. And they don't fit the screen. Okay. Anyway, uh, first let's look at the API. So we've already covered text range and text size. Uh, the green trees are what uh, was called green nodes in our mini row implementation, and uh, syntax kind green nodes, green token uh, are like all familiar things. Uh, Node token is also familiar. Uh, some things are new. For red tokens, we used just syntax node and syntax token uh, terminology. And uh, the idea here is that most of the time uh, is uh, this is like red node layer which you are working to. Green nodes uh, you don't usually interact directly with. They are like really some special case, very like deep inside the parser. So it makes sense to just like call the red tree just like syntax tree. Uh, finally, let's dive into the implementation. And yeah, like uh, this one is actually okay. So uh, here we just define a syntax kind, which is again restricted to represent on the up to uh, 6,500 and uh, 65,000 and something uh, syntax kind, which is reasonable. For us, I think uh, the total uh, amount of uh, syntax kinds, like both the tokens and the nodes, is uh, between 200 and 300, which is like not small, but uh, not big either. Uh, so let's look at actual uh, green elements. First, let's look at the tokens. And here we see that like stuff's complicated. So uh, like uh, we have green token, which is defined as just thin arc of like green token head and U8 and like green token head is like some complicated structure and there is like this uh, green token data uh, which calls, uh, which contains wrapper thin, which is like this other slice and like what's going on here. So uh, this is optimization. Uh, yeah, that's basically kind of like every, every time you see some ugly code, it probably uh, is to like work around some language limitations to make it fast. This is what's happening here. So uh, the idea is that we want to optimize memory usage and number of locations to represent green nodes. And our kind of like... Naive green node looked like this. I hate this documentation pop up in completion. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, and if we like uh, look at how this thing is represented in memory, uh, it is like kind, which is like U16, and then text is actually uh, free U sizes. And uh, this 
your sizes actually point to some actual variable length text data. Uh, that means that, yeah, and also, uh, this is actually uh, stored inside an atomic reference count, an atomic reference counter, because uh, we want our trees to be uh, like to have this structural sharing property. So there is also. This thing. So uh, this is RC. This is kind, and this is text. Yeah. So uh, there is like a lot of stuff we like don't need here. Like we. Uh, we don't actually want to dynamically change uh, the text of the nodes, so we don't need like this dynamism here. Uh, we don't need support for weak pointers, and we don't actually need to waste the whole 64-bit uh, for reference counting. Like it's okay again to restrict implementation to only support up to U32 uh, clones. Although uh, this one is kind of interesting, in a sense that like. There is no way you can like check this implementation limit for reference count. And by the way, it's like also uh, true for like usual Rust code. You can write a code which uh, in the loop clones uh, some uh, arc struct and then forgets it. And in the limit, uh, this code this code will actually overflow the counter uh, and will panic. And it's kind of like not 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 really. Uh, clear how to make uh, like make sure that like your actual pro uh, program never hits this implementation limit at runtime. So there's like still a possibility that like under some circumstances like stuff will just panic, which is quite unsettling for me personally. I kind of like love to write a code which is like robust and reliable, and I which I know that it cannot fail. But yeah, that's the case where I don't know a nice solution. Uh, anyway, so that's the presentation uh, we have. But uh, we can optimize this uh, much better. So uh, what we uh, want to do actually is first of all, we want to have only 32 uh, bits for reference counting. Kind of fine it is. But then for text, well, we only want to store uh, 32 bits length because again we uh, do not support longer strings and we actually to support want to have this variable uh, length text data in line we want to keep this in the same allocation so uh, this one is text len And this text data, and this whole thing is actually a dynamically sized type. Now, uh, writing such uh, dynamically sized types in Rust is non-trivial, and uh, that's why you kind of like it's, that, that's idea is like which is very simple to describe in words. Like you just like draw this picture, and like this picture actually, uh, like is simpler than this thing because there is like now this like extra interaction. But actually, coding this up in Rust uh, spans surprisingly a large amount of syntax because there is like no great native support for this. Oh, and like there's like one more thing. Is that uh, we usually like we usually uh, store pointers to nodes. So uh, this thing here is also like 
pointed to by some pointer. But if this is like just a dynamically sized typed, then by default, we actually get two pointers here, like the actual pointer and like uh, the length of uh, variable length uh, portion. But we don't want to do this. Uh, we want our pointers to nodes be thin because again, we store a lot of pointers and we can save substantial amount of memory by not storing this uh, second bit of information. And we really want to store the, the length of a variable sized portion inside the node themselves. And actually like uh, this bit of uh, using thin pointers here is what creates the most of overhead. Okay, so uh, how do we actually represent this? Uh, we use a fork of Triumph crate. So Triumph is a cool crate which uh, adds a lot of functionality to uh, Rust uh, arcs. And here we basically just vendor uh, a copy of it. And we do this for two reasons. First of all, we, uh, redo, uh, we, re we remove the stuff which we do not use. So like Triumph is like much bigger than uh, what's here. And the second thing, uh, we, uh, I think we do this. No, hmm, that's interesting. I think we've either, that's interesting. Yeah. So, uh, I was going to say that we, change the reference count to be a uh, U32, but uh, apparently uh, we still use U sizes here. So probably there is like, some extra, um, extra optimizations possible here. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of like uh, the thing which allows you to get rid of this uh, weak reference count pointer, uh, weak reference count inside pointer data and a thing which allows you to have this thin dynamically sized pointers. Uh, okay, so let's now look at how we actually implement this. So, uh, green token head is a data, which is a part of data, which is fixed size. And in our case, that would be just kind. The count thing I will explain later, it's like just some ZCT for zero size type for a bookkeeping. Uh, now, uh, the uh, whole, like, oh, the whole uh, dynamically sized token is like this portion is represent, uh, represented by the wrapper type. And wrapper is uh, uh, the head plus the variable size part, which is a slice of bytes in our case, because that's like string data. Uh, finally, like wrapper thin is that syntactic overhead you need to um, uh, make this compile. Uh, this is like a fixed size version of a wrapper where we say that a dynamically sized portion is actually zero elements long. Okay, so uh, this, uh, yeah, and note that this wrapper things in header slices, they actually do contain uh, the length bit. And the length is, what the hell, I, this should be a U32 because that's kind of like the reason, uh, one of the reasons why I forked this. Yeah, anyway, it seems like I didn't like fully, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, fully did what I originally intended to. Anyway, uh, I guess it makes sense uh, for someone to send a pull request trying to condense some of those counters from U size to, to to U32 and see if that gives any uh, performance memory improvements. Um, anyway, uh, the point being that a header slice contains like this header, 
the length and the actual slice. So it is like uh, this portion uh, for wrapper and uh, this portion for thin wrapper. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, green token data is uh, defined uh, just this, just as this wrapper, and uh, I think we need here, uh, we need this here because this type is public, but we don't want to expose internal implementation details, so uh, we just uh, use a um, new type wrap around here. Finally. Uh, like uh, the green token data is like this actual uh, dynamically sized blob of data in memory. And we want to point it uh, to point to it using a pointer to a reference counted data. And that's what actually a green token is. So uh, it's a thin arc. Uh, it's a pointer which points to uh, this thing plus uh, the actual reference count. Okay, because we uh, wrote like this thing by, head, by hand, we need to implement partial equality ourselves. Uh, yeah, and that's probably uh, running a bit ahead of us. Like, let's, let's, let's actually look at how like we implement actual APIs. Like the... Uh, green token is a pointer and uh, this pointer dereferences to the token data both green token and green token data are public apis and that's kind of like uh, again some ugly uh thing which i wish we like didn't have to use because like uh here like you, like when, when you're like usual rust you don't have separate types for a thing and a pointer to a thing. You have just like thing and like when you need a pointer or a reference, you just like use it. Uh, here, uh, at least I, I don't know like a great way to use a single type. We need both this like explicit pointer and also uh, like uh, an explicit thing, like uh, green token data. And kind of like, uh, the reason for that is that like green token data isn't actually a normal Rust type because it is a dynamically sized type but also a dynamically sized type uh, which the compiler doesn't know the size of because like pointer to green token data uh, should be thin so yeah anyway uh, that means like uh, actual apis are implemented for uh, green token data To get the kind, kind uh, we uh, go to the header and uh, get the kind. To uh, get the text, we ask uh, like this thin slice to uh, give us like the slice of the trailing data. And does it work? Slice. Wait. Date is wrapper thin. So this is this thing. So here slice. Wait, why doesn't this why doesn't this look at the length anywhere? Uh, it's is 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 the go to definition buggy here. So again, this is thin thing. So it. Oh my God! Yes, yeah, that's that's. <laughs> oh, it's, it's it's very confusing. Yeah. So okay, okay. Uh, this slice method should return uh, like uh, the slice of a trillion objects. And notice that it is defined of on header slice whose slice parameter is a dynamically sized slice of t's. So uh, this one is a DCT, a dynamically sized type, uh, DST. Uh, 
it's, it's, it's hard to pronounce uh, acronyms. So uh, this self pointer here is actually a white pointer. It is a pair of a pointer in, uh, and a length. And that's why, and that's how it knows to return the, uh, the right length. However, uh, the data we have here is a header slice, is a thin red, is a header slice with a zero length uh, array. Uh, so it, uh, so like uh, this impl isn't actually applicable to our data because in data there is like no t slice, there is like an uh, array of zero elements of t. But we still get here because of this deref impl underneath. And that's kind of like the magic. Uh, if you have this uh, header slice uh, with zero elements array at the end, you can actually uh, convert it to a proper dynamically sized uh, header slice using some pretty horrible magic. So uh, we take uh, the LAN length out of our like header slice because we store the length in line. Uh, now, and that is like completely horrible. So, uh, what we want to do, uh, I, I like, uh, I might explain this in confusion way because I haven't like looked at it before recording my video. So, uh, yeah, sorry if that's way more confusing than it needs to be. That basically, yeah, so, uh, we have like, uh, the thin pointer, like the self is like the thin pointer to the data. And we want to get a white pointer. Uh, we want to like graft the length bit onto this pointer. And the reason we do this is horrible. The way we do this is horrible. So uh, we and like self here is is a pointer to a header and like a certain amount of t's and the number of t's we don't know. Uh, we don't know at compile time, uh, but it is stored. Well, it's like here is actually number of t's uh, and then like t's. Okay. So. First, we make this fake slice pointer. And fake slice pointer points to this exact same thing. Like numerical value of fake slice pointer uh, is uh, the same as self, but the type of fake slice pointer is a slice pointer. So kind of like the type of fake slice pointer as is as if it points to like this amount of T's, but it actually points to the start of, of the object. Uh, and, uh, but like this fake slice pointer actually, uh, contains the correct plan. Uh, we, create a slice from raw parts and we pass the correct line together. So uh, what we have uh, here is that uh, self is thin pointer, uh, like to the right thing. And uh, fake slice is a white pointer with the correct length, but the wrong actual address. We need to shift uh, the address of fake slice by like, this amount and uh but kind of like nu numerically is what we want to do so then we just cast this fake slice to the correct type uh which uh preserves uh the correct pointer representation and uh gives us uh the right result but yeah like uh what what like what makes this uh code especially cursed is that like uh, this fake slice intermediate thing like points to like uh, these arrays of T's to uh, 
points to array of t's where there are no actually t's. So yeah, it's uh, it's messy. Anyway, uh, that's how this sliced reference work. So uh, we start from like the thin representation. Then via this deref, we go to this uh, dynamically sized representation. And then this dynamically sized representation has a slice inherent method, which gives us like a usual slice. And then that is a slice of bytes, but because we actually enforce that uh, tokens store only valid uh, UTF-8 and uh, that you can not actually modify this UTF-8 in any way, we can uh, slave safely skip UTF-8 validation and just return str. Okay, yeah, that was uh, that was complicated, but that's like Webex, and that's actually one of the simpler bits of uh, like this raw one, like the stuff uh, about editing syntax nodes, which we won't be covering uh, in the near future, is like way more complicated than this event. So yeah, uh, sorry about that. Okay, uh, finally, like the text uh, len. Uh, like which turns like the text size of actual text is like simple. We like get the text and basically cast the length of that to U32. Now that I, okay, yeah, uh, like uh, I had a moment of hesitation here is that like uh, these methods are kind of like the implementation. The implementation looks. Uh, complicated, but what we do, but what we do at runtime is just like pointer casts and pointed references with like utterly trivial. So it's important to mark those as inline. And what gives me a pause is that I didn't see an inline here. But uh, as uh, this is an impulse for a generic type, I believe uh, it will be inlined uh, even without an explicit inline impulse. So that should be okay. Okay, yeah, so uh, that's like uh, actual API of a syntax node. And then uh, green token had a deref impulse to the green token data. So uh, anytime you have a green token, which is a pointer, um, you can actually access uh, green uh, token data directly. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, the trick here is like rather straightforward. Uh, we uh, like we store a thin representation internally. Mm -hmm. Oh no, no, it's 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 the other way around. Uh, I think so. Mm -hmm. Wait, all oh, right, yeah, that's that's another difference. Uh, so uh, thin arc uh, is a thin pointer. However, it has a deref wrapper. Where this like thin pointer uh, dereferences to actually a wide pointer. So that's like uh, another bit of like uh, code, which does like this similar trick of like manufacturing uh, the right uh, metadata. Okay, so yeah, uh, like uh, pointer is a thin pointer uh, to an arc allocated struct. We dereference it to a white pointer to an actual data, but Uh, we do not want to hand out white pointers to the users. Uh, we want like all pointers to nodes actually be thin pointers. So uh, we can uh, safely cast this white pointer as a thin pointer, and we don't lose anything because like all the metadata of the white pointer is actually stored in the actual data. And uh, finally, uh, as I've said, we want to uh, write this, uh, uh, wrap this in a new type. And we do this here via transmute. Uh, 
and like that's why we need this rapid transparent uh, on the uh, green token data and uh kind of like the reason for why we cannot just uh, like create this green token data manually uh, is that we do want to return a reference here. So uh, kind of like it's important that the original green token, the original art, sort of already at runtime uh, is just a pointer to the data. And like what we actually want to do here is like return like this same pointer. Uh, but we just want uh, the type of data to be different. Again, that's kind of like the way I'm using in that uh, this is like a, a lot of uh, complicated logic, a lot of unsafe code, but at runtime, this is actually like a no-op. We take like, uh, like this self is a pointer, like 64 bits of like something, and we return like exactly the same value of self. But as I've said, like, Rust doesn't have uh, super nice abstractions to make this easy, so we need to spend this uh, elaborate, uh, like to spend all the syntax to write this like elaborate transformations and direct impulse and cast and transmute and whatnot to basically code an identity function. Uh, that's amusing, but like uh, that's reasonable to ask for if you want to write uh, very optimized code. Okay, yeah, and. Uh, kind of like uh, one of the side effects here is that, uh, like, yeah, not, not a side effect, but like interesting consideration. In general, uh, Rust assumes that it can just like copy every type by uh, mem copy in it, and that you can put every type on the stack. That's not the true for uh, green token data because it is dynamically sized and dynamically sized in a way which isn't transparent to the compiler. Uh, so we can only work with this thing via pointer. And that's why the API for creating a new green token data uh, is implemented on a green token because we, we, can, like, we cannot get a raw green token data. It's like a not first, it's not a first class construct. We can only create a pointer to it. Okay. So uh, we can now explain like this new function. Uh, we take a kind, uh, we take a text. Then we create this header. And then uh, we uh, create an actual thin arc uh, from uh, header and uh, bytes. And that's uh, like the bit where actual uh, actual ma magic happens, but uh, basically, uh, what this all does is that it alloc size of head plus um, text land bytes, and then like copies uh, the head and copies the text into the appropriate slots, but it needs to deal with stuff like alignment, allocation failures, and uh, all that complicated logic. Oh, and that's actually uh, not such, uh, because there we also have a reference count. So there is use size here as well for C. Okay, so uh, we get like this pointer and uh, g uh, get back our green token. Uh, finally, internally, uh, we sometimes need to get to cast these green tokens to raw pointers. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, what we do it here. I don't think that we'll be covering like uh, the usages of this function today, so. Uh, let me skip this, but again, this is again just like an elaborate way to explain uh, to Rust that it should do absolutely nothing with a pointer and just change its type. Okay, I guess we covered mm, anything interesting. Oh, well, uh, that's uh, that's another interesting um, impulse to own. 
So uh, not only, and uh, yeah, actually, I guess that's uh, that's uh, one way to explain uh, why we need from row here. So uh, another interesting feature about this a green token data type is that it knows that it always leave, lives inside an atomic reference count. Uh, so we only allocate uh, this within an arc. And that's why it is possible to start with a reference to a green uh, token data and return a green token. And that works by stepping backwards from green token data incrementing the atomic reference count and returning uh, the uh, resulting pointer back. And, uh, wow, this... Well, is it? No, it's not. Standard library arc is our arc, so from row must do yeah yeah that's that, that, that's magic. Okay, so like uh, pointer here is like a pointer to actual green token data, but the actual reference count lives before that. So in from row, we need to adjust this pointer and to like get uh, to step backwards and uh, that's uh, what's happening here and then we can cast that to an atomic reference count uh, anyway uh, the result here is that we can get a reference to a token data and get back a known uh, atomic reference counted uh, object out of it okay let's see if we have covered everything Okay, we didn't cover the things. First of all, like this representation is inspired by thing which is called a LVM trailing objects, which is an implementation. Uh, I guess uh, this is called uh, like this, which is like an implementation for uh, all this idea in LVM, so for C++, uh, which like makes use of inheritance and all the horrible uh, C++ tricks possible. Uh, finally, uh, what the heck is count? So uh, this is basically for governance statistics. Uh, by default, count is a no op but uh, you can enable it and then every time the count is uh, created a certain counter is incremented and every time it is deleted the counter is reset and that allows you to get useful statistics about like number of things uh, in a project so uh, let me say analyzer Uh, let's look how it works. I, I'm not sure if uh, this will work, but I think it should. Yeah, okay. So if you run a uh, Rust Lighter with uh, array count, environmental variable set, first of all, uh, you will get a very slow Rust Lighter because like counts are non, uh, are very slow for cases where they actually enabled and that's like something which can be fixed. Like there are ways to make them much, much faster. And anyway, so uh, we see that while we were analyzing the Rowan library itself, we created 1 million tokens. Uh, we uh, kept uh, 250,000 tokens uh, alive at the same time. And that's actually like uh, one cool thing is that like syntax trees are heavy they occupy a lot of memory so rustinizer tries to not keep them all in memory and to have only like a working set of syntax trees and yeah, like, you see here that uh basically we spend like five time uh less 
uh, tokens uh, there are tokens all together and uh, yeah uh, this amount of tokens uh, was live uh, at the end of a program so at the time where we uh, actually looked at the cards okay, so i guess that covers everything there is about syntax tokens uh, about green tokens let's uh take a look again so yep uh had we talked about two wrappers we talked about we talked about data we talked about partial equality uh we talked about actual green token and again now that that we kind of like need this wrapper transparent for advanced uh, trickery we talked about to own uh, which is cool uh yeah borrow is just a technicality actually don't remember if we actually need it somewhere probably i don't remember yep the back is uh simple oh uh that's that's probably uh something uh which is worth covering so yeah uh we have green token data green token so we need to implement debug for rows and for green token we want to delegate debug and the way i like to delegate debug is by like writing this uh fmt debug fmt and uh not just like data fmt uh f and the reason for that is that debug and display share the same name of, of an FMT method. And uh, if you just call the FMT by hand, you might sometimes uh, call the wrong one. This won't happen in this case, but I remember there was a bug and failure where an addition of display um, implementation to some uh, of the user types, which were using failure as a dependency, actually broke the code because uh, some type interests became ambiguous. Anyway, so okay, so that's, that's, that's a nice pattern for just like aggregating the back and uh, ditto for display. Uh, and yeah, like display for tokens is just text. So uh, inherent methods we covered, uh, construction we covered, uh, um, yeah, I guess uh, from row, like we understood how it works. Integer should be simpler. We basically need to just not decrement the reference count, and for that we use manually drop uh, and directly covered. Okay, so yeah, that's everything about green tokens. Let's now look at green nodes. They are similar. Uh, the the main difference is that uh, rather than a storing text as a trading object, uh, we store pointers to other tokens or nodes. Okay, so um, let's look here. First, uh, the header, we have kind, we have text len, which is a sum of text length of all the children. We have the same count, and by the way, uh, you see that we have this green node count as well and hmm, interesting i'm somewhat surprised that we have twice as much green nodes as we have tokens that oh right that's interesting uh yeah it's, it's, uh, I've, ne I've never noticed it but that's actually cool so if you write a binary tree, then in a binary tree, the amount of leaves is the same as the amount of the interior nodes. And that's, that's kind of actually like counterintuitive. If you kind of like draw the tree, that what you imagine in your head is that there's like all, all like kind of like the interior nodes, like most of the trees like interior nodes. And then there is like a thin layer uh, of the leaves at the end. But that's not actually how it works. Uh, because in a binary node, the amount of uh, leaves is equal to the amount of interior nodes. It's kind of like uh, easy to see. So if you take some like binary node uh, and you remove 
two leaves uh, out of it, then you reduce the amount of leaves by two. And then you change one interior node into a leaf node. So you do uh, minus two plus one for leaves and minus one for interior nodes. Uh, so that means that when you remove two leaves, you actually remove in, in the resulting node, there will be like uh, one interior node and one leaf less. And uh, that means that when you get to an empty tree, you remove the equal uh, number of leaves and interior nodes. Like the exact path, like uh, plus minus one will be different depending on the shape of the tree. But uh, the, the general idea is like this, like the amount of uh, leaves in a binary tree is equal to the amount of interior nodes. But uh, if your tree is not binary, if your tree is wider and syntax trees are typically much wider than binary, then there are much more leaves than interior nodes. So uh, that's why this is surprising that here we see the opposite, that there are like more interior nodes than leaves. But this is explained by the structural sharing. Uh, if you recall, when we were uh, writing the mineral one, I tell that one, uh, kun, uh, one cool thing there uh, is that we can use the same green tree to uh, represent uh, different parts of actual source file. So the example we had there was like something like this, one plus one uh, times one plus one. And uh, no, it was one, I guess it was oh, one times one plus one times one, not to deal with parentheses. And you basically said that uh, we use uh, the same uh, green tree for both of those subtrees. And we use the same exact token for each and every one of ones. And this caching is what uh, changes the balance here. So uh, when we build uh, syntax actual green trees in Rustalizer, we cache uh, and try to reuse identical green nodes and green tokens. And almost every token is reused. Like uh, if you like look at something like text size, like the text size is uh, repeated. Uh, I don't know how many times it's repeated. Select all occurrences. It doesn't. Okay, it's it tells uh, um, at the bottom of the screen that we have kind of like eight text size tokens, and each like text size token will be reused and in general like reusing uh, tokens is very efficient however the trees are most different there are like quite a bit of trees which are reused for example this rubber transparent is reused several times and it's like a complicated node but uh, for most cases uh, the efficiency of reuse of nodes is much smaller and that's why kind of like the amount of row uh, green tokens should actually be much higher than the amount of nodes. However, once we deduplicated stuff, uh, we get like this uh, stat that there are like twice as many interior nodes as tokens. Twice as many unique interior nodes as there are unique tokens. That's probably the right way to put it. Actually, I, that's interesting. I, I've, I've never like looked at this, like I knew in theory that this is what is happening, but I never actually thought about this. That means that actually optimizing the size of interior nodes might be something to look into. Anyway, uh, let's get back to the green nodes. So yeah, that's hand, which contains kind and uh, the accumulated, uh, like the total size of the subtree. It contains this count. For uh, the uh, variable length bit of a green tree, uh, we want to store pointers. We want to store pointers to children. And a child of a green node can uh, be either a green token or a green node. And uh, static assert, is it defined? Okay, yeah. 
uh, I, I worried a bit that like we pull static asserts from an actual CraySeo library, which I wouldn't want to do, but we uh, define it locally. And yeah, like if you're curious, like you you don't need an external crate to uh, define static asserts. You can just uh, do it do it like this. Uh, it's a relatively small amount of code, and yeah, uh, one more tip. Uh, macro rules, uh, name resolution, uh, are like pretty horrible. They are odd. They work uh, like nothing else in the language. And the promised macro 2.0 solved this and make macro names behave like usual names. But macros 2.0 aren't stable. But you can get most of the benefits today if you uh, use this trick. You define macro with an underscore in front of it. And then immediately here, you just re-export the macro as a properly named thing and yeah that has to be pub crate because macro rules implicit have implicit pub crate visibility uh okay yes so yeah uh child is either an order token and if you recall uh when we were discussing mineral one i've said that we want uh, like if we store just child then operation of getting the nth child would be time consuming because uh, we would need to sum up the lengths of all the previous children. And the way to solve it is to store a relative offset or offset of this token, this child in parent. So uh, the story today. And one more interesting Rusty. Uh, you might look at this code and realize that that's like horrible because we use this duplication. And uh, you might want to uh, factor it out. So uh, you might want to tell uh, something like this. You might want to define better grandchild, which is a struct, which contains a relative offset and an actual child, which will be node or token of Note and green token. And the reason why we uh, don't want to do this is uh, because we want the sizes, the size to be small. So if we use um, let's say size of Green child, we'll see that the size of better green child is actually larger. I think. Okay, yeah. So you see that uh, the size of this representation is two pointers, and uh, the, the size of this representation is actually three pointers. And why is that? Well, uh, the reason for that is that uh, this representation allows you to get a reference to this node token. So uh, that means that this representation should store node token continuously in memory. And node token uh, like the size of node token is two u sizes because uh, it is a union of two pointers plus a tag while in this representation uh, we do not have this restriction uh, that we like need to literally represent this node token and uh, that means that the compiler can optimize stuff out and uh, start the discriminant uh, in the gap between uh, relative offset and the actual pointer without caring about alignment. Yeah, I, I think the alignment also like plays a role here because like uh, this thing as a whole needs to be aligned by uh, your size boundary, uh, while here we can stuff the discriminant in non-aligned place. And that actually reminds me that I need to post a comment on the thread which discussed uh, like an attribute to allow turning bulls into bit flags uh, because that's, that's another case where we want to say um, something like mm, no ref 
meaning that uh, we like ask the compiler to not allow taking references to this field, to only look at it by value. Uh, with uh, the extra flexibility for the compiler to actually optimize uh, this uh, to this. Basically, I, I really would like to write this code because it is indeed prettier. Uh, but I don't know how to do this without uh, changing uh, the size. Anyway, so that's just uh, one more trick. Finally, yeah, uh, now like uh, the usual drill, uh, we define green node data. Uh, as a wrapper against like thin wrapper and uh, thin and white wrappers use like node header and dynamically size the array of green children or just empty array of green children. Uh, finally, green node is a pointer to uh, green node is an arc. And again, it uh, has like the same trick where we can go from a reference to a known type by bumping a reference uh, which is which is stored behind our data structure. We have the same borrow, which I'm not sure we really need. We even have this from cow, which why would we use it? Oh, no idea. Yeah, apparently. Oh wow! Yeah, that's yeah, that's okay. Yeah, the, 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 this cow here is actually really really cool, and we won't be covering this uh, anytime soon because that uh, is related to that editing API, which is like horrible and complicated, uh, and which we will look at later again. Like same debug uh, display. Mm, display is interesting. Display is recursive. So to display green node data, uh, we just recursively uh, display. Uh, um, each children, uh, each child. I wonder if I can do self children try for each. Here. Nah, yeah. So yeah, no, I, I cannot do uh, exactly this because I need to actually bound this MT to formatter. Okay, yeah, uh, good attempt. Uh, shame it didn't work. Okay, so uh, finally, impulse. So there uh, will be more methods here. So we uh, define some helpers. Uh, we define the header function, which uh, goes to the header. We define the slice function, which goes to the slice. So kind is just, uh, we look at um, in the header. Text land, we also just look at the header. Uh, children, uh, we just iterate over the slice. Uh, child and rich. Uh, this is um, something, uh, which is, uh, like, this is the reason uh, why we need that enum to store relative offsets. So uh, we get a relative range and we want to return a child uh, which exists at this range. And like return a child is actually a complex operation because we need to return three bits of information. We need to return an index of this child in the index array. We need to return a relative offset of this child. And we need to return uh, like the actual node token. Green element ref is just a uh, node token of two references. Okay, so we take the slice. We uh, binary search it, uh, and that, that's actually that's actually interesting because, like in general, like you cannot binary search text ranges because there is no uh, total order defined of text ranges. Like text ranges can intersect or they can uh, be contained one inside the other. But here, this is actually odd because all the ranges we have are disjoint, and it is fine if the range we are looking for intersects with any of our uh, ranges. That's like what the ordering um, methods tells uh, you. Uh, so one kind of like it, it is an order for ranges, but ranges are considered equal uh, when uh, they overlap. And uh, that's not really like an ordering because you have, like you can have a range A overlap with range B overlap with range C, and then all three would be equal, 
but we kind of like A and C uh, wouldn't actually be equal. But I think that's actually okay for binary search because uh, like the input ranges are disjoint. And for the range where session four, we are okay with finding any intersection. Okay, so uh, we use uh, binary search to find the index and then uh, we can actually uh, get the green child and get its relative offset and get uh, the actual reference. And uh, we, I do not want, uh, which actually might be stupid. Well, might not be stupid. I don't, do not want to expose a green child uh, at the API boundary of this module. So that's why I kind of like unpack this green child into text size and green element ref. Basically, I unpack this efficient pack to presentation into uh, like the nice representation with pair and denim which uh, takes more memory. But again, like unpacking here is uh, okay because we don't store this anywhere. And if you don't store things, you don't care about their sizes as much. Um, okay, to take about notifications API, we probably need to talk about creation API. And that is, well, slightly more involved, but isn't, uh, so much. Um, so again, to create a green node, we need uh, a kind and we need an iterator of children. Uh, children can be either tokens or nodes. So we use green element here and we need to know the size of the children upfront. Uh, again, because we do this like trick with collocating uh, statically sized data and dynamically sized data, we do not want to use vectors here we want to uh, know the sizes up front. That's why we require exact size iterator. Of course, the exact size iterator might be buggy, but in that case, it's like fine to panic or do whatever as long as, doesn't, as long as it doesn't cause unsafety. Okay, so our uh, first, uh, we store, like this is the iterator of children, but what we store inside is uh, those green child structs, which also contain relative offsets. So for the first need to, to convert this, inter this iterator into an iterator uh, which appends relative offsets. It's relatively uh, easy. Uh, we just map and we maintain like a rolling sum of like current offset. Then we create uh, an arc from the header, which uh, here we specify inline, although I guess it's better to extract it into a variable and children. And okay, yeah, that's oh yeah, right. Uh, that's interesting. So uh, we sort of store the length, the little length of a node twice. First of all, it is like implicitly stored in the child because like the last relative offset would be like the total length minus like the size of the last child. But we also store this explicitly uh, as a field in our header. The problem is uh, in the API, we take the iterator. So uh, we can only iterate uh, the children once. And again, iterator and iterators are lazy. So uh, although, so at this point, the text length would be zero because nothing actually caused this iterator to walk through all the children. This will only happen inside this from header and iter method where we um, where we where do we actually yeah where we like actually get like this items next. So we need to first allocate our green node and then patch the resulting size. But we already get an arc back. So we need to modify arc and that's like not super trivial because arcs are give you only shared access and we don't want to get any cells, but we know statically that at this point there is only one reference. So we can just use get mute and unwrap. And this could have been unwrapped and checked 
And then we set uh, the actual text line and then get the knock back and uh, get the node back. Uh, yeah. Uh, into row from row are the same as for tokens. Uh, one just a meta node. Uh, you see that there is kind of like a lot of duplication between nodes and tokens, and you might want to like add some kind of like high, higher level code to like reduce this duplication. But I personally don't care about this because this is like in a library and it's a comparatively small part uh, with respect to the overall library. And it doesn't affect the consumers of the library at all. Consumers just like get nice APIs. So to me, it seems totally fine to just like write the same code twice and uh, not think about it. On the other hand, if I would actually try to duplicate it somehow, like using like macros or stuff like that, I would actually make working on library code much more complicated. It's it's not the kind of duplication which uh, is worth out uh, drying out. Because like the duplication is small and the effort to actually remove it would require using some advanced language machinery. And uh, advanced language machinery is harmful. You should write like as simple code as possible. Expert writes baby code. So, okay. Uh, that's how we create a new green node, and now we can uh, see how we modify an existing node. Like uh, the common method is like replace uh, replacing a child in a particular offset. Mm, that's easy. We just check, take children. Uh, we um, clone every one of the children except the one at a specific index. And then we just like recreate the new array of children. And notice that this recreation of array of children actually recalculates relative offsets uh, for subsequent children. Because if you change a children in the middle, then you invalidate relative offsets of its uh, right siblings. To change the number of children, uh, we use this generic splice method which takes a range of children you want to remove and an iterator of children you want to uh, replace. And that's like very non-optimized. We like basically collect all the children to vector, uh, delegate to the existing splice method on the vector and return the node uh, with new children. Okay, DRF is the same as for tokens. This is just some helper functions for green children. And finally, uh, this is uh, the children array. So uh, the thing is like, why do we need here? Uh, why do we need uh, it at all? Uh, is that this array actually, uh, this iterator actually iterates over uh, this green child struct, which are this ugly space optimized representation, which we don't want to exposed to the outside world. What we want to expose to the outside world is this green element ref structure, structure which is a nice atom of two references. And uh, that's why we wrap the raw slicing traitor into children uh, struct and then map uh, into uh, in the next method. And we also need to delegate all the iterator methods to make sure that all the specializations actually work correctly. Oh, uh, not correctly, work performantly. Okay, I guess that mostly covers the implementation of uh, green nodes in actual row one. Uh, let's take a look at the element now. So that's simple. Uh, that node token is exactly uh, the same we had in uh, mini row one. And so, uh, uh, in exactly the same way, we add a bunch of impulse for uh, uh, node or token whose elements are actually green nodes. I don't think there is anything particularly interesting here. Yeah, just like delegate everything you can delegate. Finally, uh, the last interesting bit in this module uh, is the builder. 
uh, if you recall the Mineral One series, constructing green trees from scratch was very cumbersome. Like to construct even like simple trees, you need to call a lot of APIs. So uh, that's where like this builder API comes from. Uh, let's actually look at it. So green node builder is something uh, which you create. And then you have like imperative API for creating a tree. You can start node to start an interior node. Uh, you can, and then you call token to add token children to this node. And then you call start node to add interior node children to this node. And then you call finish node to actually uh, like finish the node. And then in the end you call finish now to get your syntax tree uh, back. So it's just like a convenient API for building trees. Uh, another thing uh, which it does is that it implements the structural sharing. Uh, in the mini Roman series, I told you that structure sharing is really cool. And today we actually saw how cool is it in that we actually like deduplicated at least half of all of our tokens. Uh, but I didn't explain how you actually achieve the structural sharing. And uh, the struct which does this is the node cache. And it's mm, relatively simple. Under why do we need... Okay, yeah. Uh, it's, it's relatively simple. It's, well, it just stores uh, a cache of green tokens. And uh, every time you try to construct uh, a new thing, it first tries to look up it in this cache, and uh, if it already exists a cache in cache, rather than constructing a new thing, it just returns a clone of the existing thing. So uh, let's look at token app, for example. So uh, we ask cache to give us a token with this kind and this text. First, we uh, compute the hash of this token. And uh, we need to do this manually. Like, you would think that the way to compute the hash is to create a token and hash it. But creating a token means that we need to allocate it. And this is exactly what we want to avoid. So we just like manually hash it. And then we use advanced hash brown APIs to uh, find, uh, to look up this token in the cache using manually computed hash and manually computed equality function. And then if this uh, entry is occupied, we find uh, we found some existing token, we just return this token. Uh, otherwise, uh, we just build the token from scratch and return it. And again, uh, once we build the token, we can insert it in the hash map using pre-computed uh, hash function. And we also return like this uh, hash function as a result to not forget it. We will need it when we want to insert the node. Uh, because, uh, again, uh, like, uh, that's like inserting node into cache is broadly similar, but a little bit more fiddly. I actually think it was uh, optimized after I initially wrote it, so I'm not sure if. I can fully understand what's going on here, but let me try. Okay, so uh, we create node from uh, syntax kind and an array of children. And in the array of children, we store green elements and we also store hashes. And the reason why we need hashes here is like basically the same as for tokens. We don't want to uh, allocate the node and recompute hash, but it is actually more than that. So the hash for green, like, Equality for green nodes and green tokens is structural, actually. Uh, that's something we uh, glossed over. Let's look at special equality here. Yeah, so equality is structural. Uh, when we compare green nodes for equality, we compare slices. And comparing slices means that we compare each child. And if a child is, again, a green node, then we recursively traverse a tree. So equality for green nodes is like... Uh, generally, uh, 
not a cheap iteration. And uh, the same is true for hashing. Like hashing a green node uh, is a recursive iteration. And if you do this structural sharing thing, then uh, when you like hash the tree, so yeah, like l l let's say we use the structural sharing and we like store a token in a cache and we actually score a hit. Like this token exists in the cache. Uh, like if you just naively compute the hash of the resulting tree, uh, you need to compute the hashes of all the subtrees. But because this was a hit, we already know that all the subtrees are in the cache, and we already know hashes for those subtrees. So like this like would recursively, redundantly recompute all the hashes, and we don't want to do this. That's why we uh, take care to actually mem memorize the hash functions, uh, the hash values, and always like uh, thread them in. So we get hashes for children as an input, and we return hash for the whole node as an output. So, as a heuristic, uh, if uh, the node is white, uh, if it has more than three children, we just don't cache it. And that's actually interesting because, like, the three is like, yeah, like, w w why do we need this heuristic at all? Well, the reason for that is that we do not want to cache absolutely every node. We don't want to uh, bloat the cache to store like everything. We only want to store nodes which can reasonably be reused. And uh, the current heuristic for that is, well, we, we like try to reuse uh, narrowed nodes. I'm not sure if it's uh, good or bad. Like, it might make sense to play with this constant or to change the algorithm completely and it might make the whole thing better. Anyway, so uh, if we uh, don't think that the uh, node is worth caching, we just Uh, construct a node from scratch by like uh, draining this vector of children. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually interesting. So uh, you notice that um, instead of like passing just the vector of children or an iterator or something like that, we pass like this strange thing. We pass a mutable reference to a vector and also like a like an index. And the reason for that is uh, when our green tree builder works, it actually stores all the pending nodes in a single array. So, like, uh, uh, this like parents and children basically is like so. Parents stores uh, the nodes which are currently in progress the nodes for which the start method was called, but finish hasn't been called yet. And the children and kind of like each of those parents has uh, its own array of children. Because like we can be in a situation, uh, it's gonna to be tough to uh, draw it, but basically let's say like, this is a node, it has two children, And this now also has two children. And let's say we are currently like in this position. We processed we processed this node, but haven't processed this node. Then the parents array would be uh, would contain like these two nodes, like p1 and p2. And the children of P1 would be like this node and its whole subtree, which would be complete by this point, but also an incomplete P2 node. And the children of P2 node would be like this complete node, this complete token, but this one like wouldn't be incomplete. Anyway, uh, so, so what I'm trying to say here is that P1 and P2 have different children. To optimize this, uh, we actually use a single vector for all the children. And uh, what we store in the parent is basically uh, the kind of a parent and, hey, my children start at this position in the children array. So when we, uh, yeah, 
when we start node, you see that we push the kind and the current length of the children. And uh, when we finish node, uh, we uh, know that all the nodes starting from uh, this first node, which we got from the parent stack, and up until the end uh, should become uh, the children of the current node. So we want to drain the vector starting from this position, and that's why we um, pass this explicitly. Now that I think of it, we actually might have wanted to just pass the drain iterator, but maybe we need to traverse this twice anyway. Like, that's like simple code. Just pass a mutable vector and an index into it. So uh, if we uh, figure out that the node isn't worth caching, we uh, return a new node, and that means we just like drain the children and forget about the hashes because we don't care. Otherwise, uh, we need to compute the hash. The hash for the node is the hash of a kind, then uh, the hash of every child. Uh, and again, if we notice that uh, one of our children is uncached, which we signal using uh, this zero hash, then we uh, return and notice how I kind of like try to pretend that I understand what's going on here, but I believe that this like zero condition was added after me. So yeah, I've, I've seen the return here and this makes me realize that that's why we want to return a zero hash here to signal that this uh, child was uncached. So that it doesn't make sense to try to cache the whole node. Okay, if the child is cached, we kind of like add the child hash to our hash. And finally, yeah, we get the hash. Uh, finally, uh, we get uh, the entry using this hash function using this uh, hash uh, as a key and comparing kinds, comparing length, and this one is actually interesting. So here we just fully compare the children. fully compare the children, but that's actually, that's, that's interesting. So th this is, this is bad. This is like, this would be exactly the same recursive comparison of the children, uh, which we, uh, want to avoid, uh, because yeah, ch child, like ch children, uh, are compared by value. But we don't need to do this because we know, like, if we are to cache this node, then every node is cached. So we can use just pointer quality here. Okay, I, I guess I'm I'm going to write the patch for this. Uh, I'm not sure if I am ready to do this uh, right now. Uh, but definitely uh, after this video. Uh, okay. Yeah, anyway, so uh, we uh, find out the entry in a non-optimal way. Uh, then, if the entry is occupied, then we just drop this extra children. Uh, and uh, return an already existing node. Otherwise, uh, we build a new node and hash it and return a hash and a node. And that's, I think, is more or less it. Uh, that's how the whole uh, green tree works in the real row one. So it's like a little bit more complicated. Uh, it has like some fancy caching, some fancy allocation and reference counting. But other than that, it's Uh, more or less how would you expect it to look like. Okay, I guess that's it for this lecture and I might return a little bit later to fix this inefficiency, inefficiency I've just noticed. Uh, thanks you for watching and goodbye.